Well, good afternoon. I'm Lenny Wong. Uh, on the other end of the table is my twin brother, Steve Garris. Uh, we're moderating a panel on uh, leadership and anticipating change. So, Steve, could you just briefly summarize how we got to this point? Yes, as numerous weeks ago, the uh, original moderator for uh, this panel dropped out, and uh, Lenny and I were approached and asked to put together a panel uh, on anticipating and leading change. So we said, well, we know we're going to need some people with uh, some strategic insights on how to lead the profession. We sat around and thought about it and, uh, and drew up a criteria that basically said we need someone with an enterprise lens who uh, could understand the resistance to change, understood about executing change, and then finally how to institutionalize the change. And after our conversations, we hit the mother load. Uh, because our first speaker is Major General Retired John Ferrari, whose uh, non-traditional career has gone from armored cavalry regiments to uh, being the director of the program analysis and evaluation. And we've all heard about uh, the Army's night court process, uh, cutting $25 billion in old weapon systems for modernization. We know about the need for a new root hall and getting that through uh, Army leadership. Uh, John Ferrari was knee deep in all of that. And so we're hoping to hear from him uh, what it's like to try to change something, uh, run into resistance to change, and then overcome that change. Following General Ferrari, we'll hear from our second panelist, who almost needs no introduction. Major General J.P. McGee currently serves as the director of the Army Mount Talent Management Task Force. General McGee has many years of experience as an infantry officer, but also recently served, I assume, to fulfill his broadening assignment requirements as the Deputy Commanding General for Army Cyber Command. As director of the Army Talent Management Task Force, General McGee is at the forefront of moving the Army from an industrial age personnel system to a talent management system, giving the Army the competitive advantage it requires against near peer adversaries. He has experienced the highs and lows of anticipating and leading structural policy and cultural change. So to start us off, General John Ferrari, the microphone is yours. How you all doing? Okay, I'm going to wander. I don't have any slides. Didn't use slides when I was on active duty. Not going to use slides now. <laughs> hey, so first off, I want to start off by saying thank you to you all. Right? So everybody in this room, you all could be doing something else right now. Right? You could leave the military. You, you have options. Yet you've decided to come here, make yourself better, and prepare yourself to lead this organization called the United States Army, or if you're from the Air Force or Navy, from one of the other services or a civilian organization. And that is important, and we need you, because your days of having fun are over. <laughs> There's no more kicking indoors. Some of you might be a brigade commander. One or two of you might be a division commander. But the rest of you are going to be condemned at one end or another to <laughs> defense management and staff work. But that is enormously serious stuff because that 18-year-old kid who is 15 years old today and three years from now will go in and sit in high school. How they do and how they perform, what equipment they have, what training they have, is all going to be driven by mm. that hard and difficult defense management and staff work. And it's now your turn to pay that back to the institution. And it's unglorious. Nobody puts up a monument at the War College to the staff officers or to any of that stuff. But it is deadly serious, and it is in its essence, what the officer corps is supposed to do. Because remember, as the officer corps, our job is to organize, train, and equip the Army to send our soldiers to war. A few officers get to accompany the enlisted soldiers, but not many. And so today's topic of change is very appropriate. Because you can get into your job whatever it is, and just keep doing what we've been doing as an institution. And chances are you won't be there long enough, or there'll be a hundred reasons people will give you why change is hard and why you can't do it, and that that's bad for you. If you go out and you support that, right, you're not going to get promoted again. 
but hey, you're colonels, who cares if we get promoted again, right? And I know that I could say that, right? You're sitting there going, well, you know, you're a two-star general, right? Of course you could say that, right? But my premise is that if you're serious about change and you're serious about making your mark on the institution and helping the institution move forward, you have to have an enormous amount of personal courage and you have to be willing to be shot for the cause. If you're unwilling to do that, the anti-change agents will wear you down and the institution will just keep moving forward, doing what it's doing. And so you're at the stages of your career where if you haven't realized it, right, your own personal career now has to be subservient to the needs of the institution. And you've got to be willing to approach it that way. Otherwise, right, you won't be an agent of change. You won't be able to change the institution. So let me give you a couple of examples uh, from things that recently I've been involved in that were just really hard institutional changes. <clears throat> so the first is Night Court. Okay. And so the whole Night Court process was born out of the need that the Secretary and the Chief at the time, Secretary Asper and General Milley, publicly made a statement that they were going to move money into modernization. They made that statement before they actually knew what they were going to do. They made it publicly. And so in that example, the driving force of change was the leadership at the most senior levels publicly declared change. And that became a motivating factor for them. So much so that they told us in January they wanted to do it, and by May, as the leader of the night court process, right, we were going through the normal process, we weren't generating the money. We were blocked at every avenue of change. Cut the 50 cal. Well, you know, the trade our commander is light infantry. He likes the 50 cal. He can't cut the 50 cal. Cut this. Well, you can't cut that because of this. Well, there was a leader who, through no fault of their own, had a deeply held conviction that that path for that item was the best thing for the Army. And they believed it. And in most cases, it was entirely true. For that particular item, for that particular thing, that was the best choice for the Army. But for the institution, was it the right answer? Nobody goes to work and says, today, I'm going to sub-optimize my program so that the Army can optimize itself. Nobody does it. But at the strategic level, as the PA&E, the chief and secretary, that was our job, to sub-optimize every single part of the Army to optimize the Army as a whole. But because the change was so far-reaching and we couldn't get there, it took, in this case, the chief and the secretary sitting for 40 hours at a conference table with senior general officers coming in, defending their programs, and them calling the ball on each and every one of them. And they had a sense of moral clarity in that they had a vision for the change. It was modernization. And they were able to articulate a criteria, which was, tell me, General, Colonel, SES, why your program is more important than changing a 50-year-old combat vehicle that an 18-year-old kid's going to do a forward passage of lines at night against the Russians under fire. And if you can explain to me why you need something, that 50 cal, that MRAP, that training event is more important than that, then we'll have a conversation. And I got to tell you, I watched leaders try to have that conversation. They started with a 15% reduction. At the end of the conversation, they were at 25%. I watched a three-star walk in to defend his program. He went in with an $85 million cut, came out with a $150 million cut. Towards the end of the process, nobody walked in anymore. <laughs> right? But that's an example of change to an institution 
that thus, only thus, senior leaders could drive. And they could drive it because they had moral clarity <laughs> on what they had, and they had painted themselves deliberately into a corner so that there was no way out other than to do it. Because had they not done that, it would have been easier to go, OK, General Silver, I'll let you have a little bit of that, a little bit of that. But we had a tote board. And we were like, hey, OK, we're, this, we're still short. We're still short. We're still short, right? They bring them on. So that's change at the institutional level. Second change was the win T wars, right? That was probably the most brutal change management lesson that I've been through in my whole time in the Army. For 15 years, the Army was building out a network, had a program of record. It failed, it failed, it failed, it failed, poor money, poor money. But the institution that had grown up around it and our institutional inability to admit failure wouldn't allow us to step back and say, it's not working. We have failed. And there was clearly an alternative which was go commercial, right? We will never be able to build a communications network better than the commercial providers. And if we try to build it on our own, it will be so phenomenally expensive and so outdated by the time you get it to the field, it will barely work. But there were lots of institutions lined up for it, everybody would put money into it, the PEO structure, the trade-off structure, the, right? Everybody had a stake in keeping this alive and not admitting failure. We had to bring in an outside person. Actually, we didn't do it. The Congress of the United States grew so frustrated with the program and the Army's inability to look itself in the eyes and that's what our congressional overseers are looking for out of you and us is, are we willing to look ourselves and say, this isn't working, we need to change. And when we don't, then they get involved and they change. And they hired Ida, the Institute of Defense, to do an analysis of the Army network. And Ida came back and said, holy cow, this thing isn't going to work, and no matter how much money you pour in, it'll never work. It took 18 months of hour upon hour meetings and trials and tribulations. And in the end, what drove it home, what drove home and drove the final decision was General Milley, who was leading that discussion, went into Syria and was watching the special operators conduct missions in real time against enemy forces under combat using essentially the commercial network and iPhones and commercial encryption. And then he would come back and he'd go, well, why can't we do this? And people go, oh, it can't be done. He's like, well, I just saw it. And at that point, the resistance crumbled, right? And now we're fielding Jim Mingus's division in the 82nd with a whole suite of this stuff that'll drag us into the 21st century. But I was told halfway through that, hey, be careful. The chief might like you poking at all these people, but right, the people, they, they don't like you poking at them the way you're poking at them. I said, hey, not here to worry about whether they like me or not. And we kept poking and poking and poking and poking and poking until we made the right decision. Because as you go up, there's this pressure to go along and get along. But you have to resist that. You have to know what's right, stick to it, and make your case. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. The third thing is I completed before I left a migration of my commercial, of my Army Enterprise system to the Amazon cloud one of the first cloud migrations. And I swear that thing gave me more heartburn than anything else. So I got a computer science degree. 
been a data scientist, right? Been part of the enterprise, and I could see this cloud thing coming back about four years ago. And I tried to grab all the feeder systems to my left and right and come with me in this journey. And that frozen middle you read about rose up against me across the board. People were unwilling to give up control of their data or their software because it meant they lost money, it meant they lost control, even if they would admit that it's probably better for the Army, but it's not good for them or their organization. And for all of you, the approach that I always tell people who want to drive change is when you're put into an organization, you are an Army senior leader. You are there to do the bidding of the United States Army, to bend your organization and change your organization to the needs of the Army. Most people who go into organizations view it as their job to protect that organization. And that's when you get kind of the anti-change. This is what we do. We can't do that. We can't change. People will bring it right. The, the example you hear all the time, where you stand depends upon where you sit. is, to me, completely and utterly false. Either you have convictions and understand where the Army needs to go, and you are part of the Army enterprise who's going to drive that, and the costs to your organizations are interesting, but in the scheme of the Army, relatively unimportant. Or you're going to be part of the, you know, when people get around and go, man, how come the Army can't change? You just raise your hand and go, well, I'm, I'm part of the reason the Army can't change, right? I changed my mind, right? If, I, if I'm on the talent management task force, I'm all for it. But if I'm at HRC, not so much, <laughs> right? How can that be? So I'm going to get the hook here in a few minutes. So I was walking with my boss, three star about a year and a half, well, maybe about three years ago. And we were talking in the hallway, and he said, uh, hey, I'm going to make this move, this change. And I said, oh, that's a pretty good idea. He kind of stopped walking, and he kind of looked at me. He said, John, I've never heard you actually agree with anything I've said. <laughs> and I said, you really didn't come off to me as somebody who needed my positive affirmation. So if I agreed with you, I'm just going to sit there and be silent. The only time you're going to hear with me is when I disagree with you. And so as you're out there and you're thinking and you go to meetings, how many meetings do you go to where everybody says, hey, boss, that's a pretty good idea. Hey, what do you think of that? How many meetings do you go to where they go around the room and the people at the table say, Hey, you know, I want to do this. And then somebody points somebody at the end and goes, well, I agree with what my boss said. Right? Really? Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Right? Do you have the courage to stand up and say, well, I don't agree with what my boss says? I was lucky in that all the bosses I had over the course of my career, and especially in PA&E, because we had an independent function, right, I could say, well, I know General so-and-so said that, but I, I don't agree with that. Now, it was generally followed by, well, I hate to agree with John, but, right, okay. Right, I would purposely play the role of the opposite decision a lot of times, right? When the Army as an institution is barreling ahead on a certain path, sometimes you've got to say, whoa, wait a minute. How about a different point of view here? Right, are you willing to stand up and play that role? Do you know how to play that role? The last thing I want to leave you with is look at the civilian sector. Amazon was started by Jeff Bezos. Right, and true story, he was a finance analyst working for a Wall Street firm. He was analyzing the internet and said, holy cow, I see commerce on this thing. 
So he packed up his wife, got in a car, drove west to Seattle, halfway across the country in Nebraska, calls up his friend who's a lawyer, says, hey, I'm going to start a company. They go through, they fill out all the paperwork. He goes, I'm going to call it Cadabra. Okay, at the other end is like, you're naming it after a dead body? <laughs> right? It's like Cadabra, oh yeah, right, that's not going to work. So it's going to be amazing. Amazon, that's how they came up with the name Amazon. It was somewhere in Nebraska, Montana, somewhere in there as he was trying to figure it out. But he, here's a guy with no retail experience, barely has information technology, but he could see the trend and he had a vision. Look at Sears. At the same time, in 1960, you could order a house from Sears and they would deliver it to you. Only last year could you do that with Amazon. So here's a company, Sears, that was doing delivery to home. That was doing everything that Amazon is now worth a trillion dollar for. How is it that Sears, which had better access to people, better access to capital, better access to everything, is in bankruptcy court and Amazon is worth a trillion dollars? Right? Because there was this discontinuous change where the leadership of Sears couldn't see the future. And they went off into financial services. They got rid of their catalog division. Right, The leadership, the leaders, couldn't see what was happening in front of them. And they could have bought Amazon in the mid-2000s. And they didn't do it. The moral of that story is why do great organizations fail? How many great organizations are able to make that change? And what is it that prevents them? And I bring that up because you are part of a great organization. And the question is, right, how do we change? How do we prevent ourselves from losing the next war, being beat by somebody who's coming at it in a different direction? Those are the stakes. And fortunately or unfortunately, I think unfortunate, none of us bear the brunt or the risk of any of our bad decisions. From here on out, every bad decision you make is going to roll into the rucksack of a 15-year-old boy or girl who's in high school, who's going to join the Army in two or three years and bear that risk. So as you're going through and as you're studying and as you're taking care of yourself, right, think about that. Think about why change is hard and how you're going to overcome that. Thank you, sir. We'll now hear from General McGee. Take, take this one. So, first off, you, get a, you just got a chance to listen to a true Army legend in terms of someone who is more than always willing to speak truth to power. And I sat in multiple meetings with multiple chiefs where John Ferrari told the emperor that he was not wearing any clothes, and our Army is dramatically better because of it. Okay. But I'll tell you a quick funny story. When I came into this job last July, so two Julys ago, to be the director of the Army's Talent Management Task Force, I had worked on the Army staff with, uh, with General Ferrari before. And so as I was making my way around, I made it a priority to go talk to him first off because he had so much experience. And frankly, he had so much insight on the Army staff, where the Army was going, and he had just critical sort of strategic insights. So I came to his office, set up an appointment. I was a one-star, he was a two-star. I, I sat down across from him. I said, sir, I'm the new director of the Army's Talent Management Task Force. Do you have any advice for me? He looked at me squarely in the eyes and he said, JP, I do. He said, uh, the Army's got a lot of tough jobs ahead of you in the future. This isn't one of them. Make sure you catch up on your sleep. Make sure you do lots of PT and make sure you take care of yourself because you're going to have a tough job where people actually expect something from you, but this isn't it. Army leaders aren't serious about driving the change that's necessary. So don't spend too much time worrying about this and just get ready for your next job. 
<laughs> Why did I tell you that? And, and he told me that because I think it was an accurate read of, of certainly where he thought it was, but also because we had had a collection of other, you know, this is, I think I'm the fourth director of the Talent Management Task Force, and it didn't have enough senior leader buy-in to drive the changes. I think we're in a fundamentally different position right now. But, uh, you know, I think he not just speaks truth to power, he's tremendously candid with everybody. And again, I think all of us who know him have benefited from that. So I'd like to hit two quick slides with you and talk about what we're trying to do in terms of the Army Talent Management Task Force in terms of just general education. And then I'll switch over to the topic of, of what it means to try to change the Army, at least from my perspective and my experiences. And then we'll go to, I think, probably the best part, which is going to be the, the question and answer period. So next slide. Okay, so one of the big things we've got to do in this job is try to frame why we're changing, why there's a need for change, how we're trying to change. And so one of the things we've tried to do is articulate the reasons for change. Now, strategic messaging, I think, is frequently overstated in terms of its importance. It's obviously very important, and it is a critical component of, of our sort of outreach and making sure people understand I think you would be foolish to think, though, if you just had a good strategic messaging campaign, you would overcome all resistance. As if somehow the access to knowledge and clear messaging is actually the answer to getting you know, things solved, okay? So raise your hands if you know what the components of a healthy diet are. Come on, everybody knows. It's all out there. That has been strategically messaged very well. And then just ask yourself, how many American citizens have access to that same information and how many American citizens actually eat healthfully? Okay? So we know what it means. And so I'm just saying it's not, it's not that in and of itself is not the only thing that's going to get you the answer, but it's a, it's a key component. So let me just talk about what we're trying to do with talent management. So first off, it's, it's embedded and it's at the core of all the transitions and this transformation the Army is trying to go to as we try to move ourselves from an industrial age practice to an information age practice. What does that mean specifically if you're talking about you know, how we manage our people? So if you're an industrial organization and all of us grew up in, who grew up in the United States Army grew up in an industrial organization, there are a couple sort of framing thoughts. And it's the idea is the institution brings in a significant number of people. It's their job to raise them to a minimum acceptable level of competence. And then once they're at that level of competence, you can jam them into any jobs because there are a series of interchangeable parts that can fit anywhere within the institution. They can perform well enough so collectively you get, a, uh, you, get a, you get a good enough level of performance across the entire board. If you've got large numbers as we do, you have to couple that with a conveyor belt system of promotions because it's the only way you can manage a huge population because you're not enabled with information technology. You can't manage people discreetly. It's, it's, it's just the way our system is set up. Our system is built on two pieces of legislation because legislation drives a lot of how we manage the officer corps. It's the Officer Personal Act of 1947 and the Defense Officer Personal Management Act of 1980. Okay, all of which are definitely just firmly entrenched in the sort of vision and practice of an industrial age organization. An information age organization says something a little bit different. An information age organization says you bring these people and you've got to sort of meet the standards to get them in, but you take their uniqueness into account in terms of how you develop them as officers and then how you employ them over a, over a period of time. And that's part of the institutional requirement for you to do that. And that uniqueness then allows you to treat people flexibly and not everyone needs to be treated as if they fit within an IBCT or an ABCT because you have a system that's empowered with information technology that can allow you to then manage their people much more flexibly instead of having to do this in tremendously rigid fashion. So if you think about industrial, you talk about performance management in terms of like, you know, are the top performers or not, and then quantity distribution. And I think when you talk talent management, you're talking about something else because performance is just one subcomponent of, uh, of talent. And then you always, and within the Army, have to get the quantity, quantity piece right. But that's, that's sort of at the core difference. So as a task force, what we've been told is to go forth, starting with the officer corps, and figure out those subgroups of the population with which to conduct pilots and prototypes to figure out concepts for how we can manage the rest of the Army. And our guidance is to move very rapidly. And the guidance is not to just make changes on the margins. Okay, So we're not looking at doing minor changes to the system. We're talking about significant and dramatic changes to how we manage the officer corps. And so the idea is you do it with a small group of the population. You experiment and see how that works. If it's applicable and it works, you scale it rapidly to do it to the, uh, to the rest of the officer corps. 
It is all about getting a 10x change, not a 10% change. And back to General Ferrari's point, most of us are very comfortable with a 10 with a 10% sort of change. You hop in, you're a company commander, you're a battalion commander, if you do 10, 15% better than the person before you, you're sort of hitting it out of the park. But you don't talk about someone who goes into battalion command and radically transforms what it means to be a battalion commander in the United States Army. It's just not the way we're raised, but that's the mission that we have. So it makes it a little bit, uh, a little bit unique. We talk about the requirement that if you want to be able to have a talent management system, you have to have a granular level of knowledge about the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and preferences, those things that we define as talents, for every officer in your inventory for which to manage them. We're talking at this point about moving from a data-poor environment to a data-rich environment about how we manage our people, because if you have more relevant information, you'll make better decisions, hopefully, as an individual or as an institution on how we manage our officer force. So you see a lot of the things that we're doing are, you know, are, are on the face looking at something different, but really are at its core about gathering this data about how we can better manage the officer corps. And I'll highlight some of these things when we talk about the two big initiatives we're unrolling right now. Why do we need a, so we're gonna bump into Army cultural norms and Army culture as we do these changes. We're already seeing that. I'll talk when I start talking about driving change. And then why does the Army need a new system? Frankly, we are looking at going against competitors who have all the advantages we used to have. They have gigantic populations if you're China. Okay, much larger than ours. They've already got that. They've got an economy that's our size or about, you know, or, or about to be larger than our economy. The technological gap that we've enjoyed against adversaries is about to be closed by them. So in order to stay competitive, we've got to take advantage of those things that are uniquely and specially, you know, our American sort of strong points and one of those, or strengths, and that is right now, I think our people, our leadership, and our ability to cultivate that and bring that in. What, as we transition as an army towards talent management and doing this, what we're effectively recognizing is that we are in a war for talent to retain our best officers so they can contribute to the, the future of the United States Army and the future of the United States in terms of their contribution to the mission. And it's really throwing away that all people are sort of equal and our people are a set of interchangeable parts. And that's some of the core challenges we're working through. Uh, the other piece of this, I'm sorry, just one, is, is the fact that there are different societal norms that are, with the officers that are coming in right now. So we as a society have changed since I was commissioned. You know, right now dual income is the norm and it's not abnormal. So the idea of an army spouse needs to start looking like a spouse who has a job because that's what the rest of America is doing. People have expectations about jumping around and doing you know, different jobs and different experiences, maybe having increased permeabilities as they can explore other options and still be able to come back. This is all trying to get the Army more aligned with where our society is and still retaining you know, our best and brightest and making us effective. Next slide, and this is the last slide, is how do we try to at least encapsulate, and this was an attempt for us in one slide talk about where we are today and where we're trying to go. I'll use this to illustrate some of the uh, some of the initiatives we're doing. Frankly, I'll talk about those more deeply in the in the breakaway session after this, if you would like. But, uh, but if nothing else, this is talking about where we are today. So you take a look at the left hand side. That's our current officer personnel management system. We talk about where we want to be aspirationally in the uh, in the future. We start off with what these characterizations are. We talk about management, organization, and process, all of which are in significant need for improvement within the United States Army. Um, just trick, a couple of trick questions here I do like to ask. Okay, so these first ones are not trick questions, but what organization and individual is in charge of the, uh, the development and management of training and doctrine within the United States Army? TRADOC and General Funk. How about what organization and individual is in charge of all material and logistics issues inside the United States Army? So who is in charge of managing, what organization or individuals in charge of the management of the strategic direction of the United States Army's Officer Corps? Okay, nobody, right? There are like seven different organizations that play an outside his role, G3FM, G3 training under the G3, all the different proponents who work for the CAC commander, all the different functional air proponents who work for someone different. You've got the HRC commander, the G1, the ASA, MNRA. It's completely disaggregated across the Army. I think it's a problem, and uh, it's one of the things that we're starting to take a look at. Um, as we talk about the future system as well, we talk about being able to leverage technology and create a data-rich environment. You will be shocked to know that most of the IT systems that manage your officer core today are written in code from the 1980s and 1990s and have about a zero predictive capability in terms of anything. So six months ago when the Secretary of the Army said, let's make all company commands go from 12 months to 18 months as the minimum standard, we said, okay, well, let's put this in the machine and find out what that means to queuing times at different installations. What's that gonna mean for CGSC three years down the road? What's that gonna mean for battalion commands eight years down the road? No system could do that for the Army right now. 
Okay. It's just the way we it's the way we run our system right now. It's only a stretch to say that the officer corps of the United States Army and the active component is managed off Excel spreadsheets. Um, so those are the things we're looking at. Try, some of the things we're trying to look at change in terms of what are the things that we're trying to do. I'll highlight uh, the four the sort of the four big bridges we're doing is this Army town alignment process that's ongoing right now. Some of you are actually involved in that marketplace. Let me give you a couple of quick data points. That is a system by which individuals can describe themselves on the front and back side of their ORB. Units have a responsibility to describe the duty positions that are coming open. We have pushed a hiring authority now to the brigade level, and when the market opened, I think on the 11th of October, every officer in, a mo in that movement cycle was ever able to see every job that he or her were, he or she was, uh, was available to take. Okay, just to give you an idea, and it had a bumpy start because of the, uh, the IT system, sometimes that happens. But if you had every officer that's available, all 14,000 officers do every preference that they could do because they have the ability now to like prefer 200, 300 jobs. The total number of preferences that officers would be allowed to submit is 1.2 million. Two weeks into this, more than 500,000 preferences have already been submitted by officers. So for the first time ever, we're able to see these things. Okay, so units get to hire their own people. Individuals get to have much greater transparency and ownership. We've eliminated a bunch of the, uh, the sort of restrictions in terms of career paths and career timelines, so officers' preference can play a bigger role. And at the end of this, as we talk about moving from data poor to data rich, what we now have is a repository of all sorts of information about our officers as self-described, about the duty positions and what they look like, and we can start tracking these longitudinally over what really are the skills that we require, and we can develop all sorts of in interesting information about, about the officer corps. I can talk about that more later if you want to, but we're already moving into a data-rich environment in terms of that, just from the limited uh, experiment or, uh, prototypes we did previously. Second big one we're doing is in promotions and selections. You've, saw, you've seen this, I think, come out in the, in the news and some other things, but we have just announced that we are gonna do the Battalion Commander Assessment Program. That's gonna be in January into February. In September, the Battalion Command and Critical Billet uh, Board met just like it normally does. There were 1,135 officers who opted in for consideration for those. The board met and established an order of merit list that went one to 1,135. We then took a look at, uh, at how many positions we would need to fill, and just simply, if like infantry needed to fill infantry 50 in infantry battalion commands, we then said, let's have an overage, so let's bring in like 80 officers. We then figured out what that cut line is, and that means 816 officers are going to be invited, have been invited to attend one five-day assessment and selection process that's gonna be held at Fort Knox. Uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. When candidates for battalion command are gonna run through a five-day assessment program, we're gonna look at them physically, we're gonna look at them psychologically, we're gonna have them do a writing test and a verbal communications test, we're gonna do a cognitive, non-cognitive assessment on them, we're gonna have them go through a blind, uh, blind board interview panel, and at the end of that, we're gonna make a determination on whether they should go into command or not. And for those who've been deemed as ready to go into command, we're gonna reestablish the OML based on bringing all those factors in and, uh, and weighing them accordingly. Past performance will be carried forward as well based on your performance on the Central Selection Board. So that's happening on the, uh, the 15th. We, dan we did the, the sort of pilot of this at Fort Benning, Georgia in June and July with the alternate list for uh, infantry and armor officers and the results were, fr were frankly fascinating as we went through this entire process. We're looking at establishing fle flexible career paths and promotions and selections. I'll transition here pretty quickly though in terms, so those are some of the big changes that we're unrolling. But the topic of this is how do you manage change and how do you, uh, you do this. I'll just give you, I'll give you a couple, a couple thoughts on managing change specifically within the Army, although I tend to think the dynamics are the same no matter where you do it. So the first thing I've seen, is, and I've seen this in other organizations as well, is everybody loves change until it impacts them, okay? So I was at Army Cyber, I got put in charge of the talent management process that was there, and I went and talked to the officers and the warrant officers, and they all uniformly said, the Army system for managing officers absolutely sucks, it's unimaginative, we're not rewarded enough, it's not special, it can never accommodate our uniqueness and specialness as a branch and what we need to contribute, and it's like a sort of failed mission. So I said, well, give me a try. So six months later, we had changed some things. We had gotten some flexibilities. We had gotten a whole bunch of additional assignment pay and, and been able to sort of start compensating them a little bit better. And then we started doing something a little bit different. We said, uh, well, let's start going out into places like Google and trying to direct commission officers into the cyber force. And then all of a sudden, the officers started saying, whoa, 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 that's not the change that we want to have. 
Like, you mean I've got to now compete against a software engineer from Google, which means you're probably one of the best in the world? Like, hey, that guy didn't go to ROTC. That guy didn't go, he didn't start joining the Army when he was 18. Like, you can't bring him in our ranks. Like, it's going to destroy our culture if you bring someone in. And I always just thought that was sort of, you know, surprising. You went to the, you went to the warrant officers and he said the warrant officers, and you said, well, look, like in the aviation community for decades, we've done this thing called high school to flight school. Why don't we do this thing called high school to keyboard? And they're like, sir, you don't understand what it means to be a warrant officer in the United States Army. <laughs> you need to have broad leadership skills. It's like, nope, nope, you really don't, you know? <laughs> That's actually not why we made warrant officers. It's for deep technical skills. Well, if you haven't been an E6, you know, you have no right being a warrant officer in the cyber field. And I was like, well, let's see if we can break that paradigm a little bit. And so my point is, I learned that everybody loves change until they're changed by it, okay? And that's just a very, very human nature. Um, I would say, though, it's important for us to get our heads around this because the world that we live in, the environment we are going to live in, you know, this environment that is rapidly coming at us and is defining our future, is going to be defined by near constant change. And so organizations that fail to adapt either go out of business in the civilian world or find themselves not ready for the next conflicts that are, uh, that are coming their way. And what I th sometimes find is how the way we manage our people breeds a structural and sort of intellectual and almost psychological rigidity that I would argue over time is going to make us non-competitive in, uh, in future fights. I will say that uh, trying to you know, be in charge of this task force, it's, it's important that uh, you understand that where we sort of fit within the line and block chart within, uh, within the United States Army. So my boss is the chief of staff of the Army, General McConville. I can only tell you that helps a tremendous amount. Okay, so previously it was Vice Chief Staff of the Army, and people were very interested in, uh, in that, but there were, you know, General Milley, he was very focused on readiness as well we needed to be. Luckily, this gave us about a year to get a foundation to get going, but now as he is coming as the chief, it's very, it's actually really encouraging to watch the Army and the Army staff rally around supporting their boss, General McConville, and driving this. And so I, I continue to joke that uh, today talent management is a bit like that old saying about logistics. I don't know what the hell it is, but I want some of it. And so I am talking constantly to the Army staff, and the Army staff is trying very hard to embrace the changes and support the things that we are, uh, we are trying to do. I'd also like to highlight that it is hard for any organization to innovate and execute simultaneously, and sometimes I think that is a fool's errand to ask them to do it. I mean, I was an infantry brigade combat, uh, combat team commander. I think I was okay at that job. I think if you had given me a team of experts and we had gone off to some offsite and we had tried to sort of figure out what the best IBCT in the future looks like, I could do a pretty credible job of figuring out that what it would look like for 10 or 15 years, what the demands are going to be. I think if you asked me to do that while I was conducting combat operations in Afghanistan, you'd get a really suboptimal performance. You know, the sort of urgency of day-to-day -day operations would overtake any, any attempts I want to have to do, uh, to do innovation. And similarly, it is interesting to note that I have never served a day in my life in any personnel assignment within the United States Army. I've never worked at HRC, never been an assignment officer. Um, but I don't think either if I'd had that as a background or if I was part of that organization right now, we would be, able, we would be given the sort of free reign to be able to innovate and, uh, and, and drive these sort of changes because we'd be overcome with the, uh, with the sort of urgency of the now. So our methodology for how we're trying to do this is first off, we study these issues to make sure that we've actually got an area that needs to be changed. Okay, so there's a lot of sort of conjecture about how we manage the officer corps as opposed to facts. So we've been trying very hard to drive the right data to help us see clearly where we need to drive change. Uh, we then take our sort of ideas and we pilot and prototype them. We call that testing. If they prove valid and worthwhile to the rest of the Army, we, are then you know, we then implement them across the entire Army and oversee that implementation. And then over time, we, uh, we transition this over to, to the organizations that need to be responsible for it. So for the Battalion Commander Assessment Program, we studied and figured out we probably could do a whole lot better job of picking battalion commanders than just for you and OERs. And there's probably a lot of information out there that we should consider before we make that determination for the Army. We tested it at Fort Benning in June and July. We are in the process of being in charge of this implementation in January and February, and then we will, we were doing the entire process with an eye to transition it to TRADOC so they can do it the following years and so we can go on and do other things. I would argue probably one of the things we need to add to that methodology is continue to maintain oversight of it as it goes, as it goes forward. 
So let me talk about what resistance to change looks within the United States Army from my vantage point. Uh, and again, I think this, uh, some of these are sort of unique. So one of the things that I think is unique is you're dealing with officer issues. If you're, uh, if you're on this, in this task force, you know, officers are all across the Army and are all across, you know, our sort of uh, community of interest. So there are a lot of retirees as well. And it's the first job I've ever had where everybody approaches the issue from the perspective of how the Army treated them. Some people, the Army, some officers, the Army has treated very well. And some officers, the Army, at least in their opinions, has not treated them very well, and it really colors it. And so, you know, people will come up and ask, you know, come with these very hard, hard, heartfelt opinions, and I ask them, like, what study, where do they get this information, and it really is from a data set of one, and that's their experience. My, uh, my favorite example, I won't say the institution, I was talking to this distinguished elder gentleman who was supposed to be an expert in all sorts of fields, and he looked at me very seriously in the eyes and he said, you know, General McGee, I want you to understand the Army has a significant problem with the way their senior raiders write their OERs and it hurts the officer corps in terms of their ability to, to write OERs. And I said, sir, that's, that's a really interesting insight. Like, where did you gather that? Like, did you guys do a study? Because he's from a, you know, pretty credible think tank. You guys do a study that indicates that? And he said, well, well no, but I was a training room clerk in 1962 and my company commander was a really bad writer and the lieutenants he worked for were disadvantaged. That happens all the time in this because it's a really personal sort of a thing for us. I, I think the other thing I keep on bumping into was, is this whole idea is, is it good enough? You know, isn't the current system good enough? Like it, it was sort of good enough for me and I think under, underneath some of these, this whole idea was like, would I do okay in a future system that we're imagining or would I be disadvantaged? People can't help but take that very personal approach. I just anticipate it uh, you now. I think, and I keep on getting, you know, how would, uh, you know, how would certain leaders from history be like sort of, how would they do in this current process and how would they be managed? And I started by asking is like, how do we know the qualities of that leader or the qualities that we need to lead our army in the next 15 to 20 years? Like, is that the right, is that, is that the right set of skills? So let's start about what we want to have in the future and then backtrack it, as opposed to sort of finding people from 100 years ago and saying how we would propel them into this environment, okay? But it's, it's a very natural uh, resistance. I talked about the, I talked about the personal example, the, the N equals one, which is why data is so important as, as much, much of this. I do love this one. I, I want to put a shout out for our current chief staff of the Army, so, Three years as the G1 of the Army, two years as the Vice Chief Staff of the Army. So he is two years as two plus years as a division commander. So he's got a lot of time working the personnel business. I would go so far as to argue that in my time as an Army officer, almost 30 years now, we've probably never had a chief who understands the people side of the Army better. Okay, with all the experiences that uh, that he has had, but people still say, "Well, I know what he said, but he doesn't understand the risk." And I say, "No, no." He intimately understands the risk. It's been articulated in multiple different ways, and he still wants to move out of these. But this idea of trying to frame risk, and it's interesting to me when I see people frame risk, because we tend to frame risk and readiness in the same sort of very short term. Okay, so the, the, the risk is, you know, that we're not going to be ready six months from now. There's not a whole lot of discussion about whether we're going to be ready six years from now or ten years from now. And so we tend to have this very myopic view of risk in terms of how we manage our, our force, in terms of getting people into seats as opposed to developing the right skill sets to win future wars. wars. I think lots of people don't understand the current system, so they don't understand the need to change. When you start to educate them a little bit, I think it sometimes causes their eyes to open. I argue most of you don't understand the inadequacies of the current IT systems we use to manage our officer corps, for example. A lot of people come and say, you know, is this worth the money for us, what we're going to do? Like, we're going to run the battalion commander assessment program. It's going to cost a lot of money. Just so you know, it's going to cost around $4 million for us to do this. Is that worth the money? I mean, you tell me, how, how does one determine that? If we screen out five toxic battalion commanders, is that worth the Ill, Ill effect it's gonna have? If we, is that line at 11 battalion commanders or is that line at 20 battalion? I mean, you tell me where that line exists because I don't know how you do those sort of calculations. I think we can show and demonstrate the value to the people that we screened out and maybe longitudinally over time, but in the short term you can't, but that's gonna be a question like, how do you know, how are you gonna know this is successful? Well, I don't think you're gonna know. I think you've gotta collect data over a long period of time and hopefully over time we're gonna be able to see. But some of this data that we're collecting and looking at is the first time we're ever gonna be able to collect it. So the data sets start now and go forward. We're probably not gonna be able to retrospectively go back over the last 20 years. 
I was just talking this with, uh, with Steve Garris on the way in. I love this one always, which is what problem are you trying to solve, which really means I don't like the problem you're trying to solve. Um, you know, we did an offsite where we spent a day taking a look at the inadequacies and some of, some of the issues with our current human, uh, the way we manage our officer core. We effectively filled up about two walls worth of thoughts on where it is. Uh, I tend to just sort of take the shorthand that that's not the question I want to ask because it's too long. And I just say everything that stops the current officer management system from being the very best in the world and recognized as such, and the, the gulf between where we are today and achieving that end state, that's the problem. Um, a lot of people will ask me, how bad is it really? The fact of the matter is our system's not bad. It's not. It's probably the best industrial-based system for an officer population this long. Large. That doesn't mean it's the right system to drive us forward and make sure that we're competitive in the future. But people will ask that. I mean, it's not like the whole thing's burning. People are getting assigned. We're doing an okay job. We sort of meet our numbers and things sort of work. Uh, the survey that I passed that would tell you that officers aren't generally very happy with the current officer management system that we have. Um, but, but I mean, it, that, is, that is another way that people resist change. I already talked about how people continue to talk about how it hurts readiness, but it's always about short-term readiness in the next six months. People generally tell me that we need to go slower. Um, I ask them why. I ask them if we wait six months, do we really think we're going to get six months worth of insight? Or instead of executing the changes in the next month that we know are going to be painful, are we just going to do what we generally tend to do, which is if we wait six months, not even really approach the changes until we're a month out from the change next time, in which case you've got to demonstrate to me that there's a tremendous amount of value for us waiting longer to study the problem that we already know exists instead of, uh, in, instead of executing rapidly and getting all the gain that we would get. So for example, we're right now underdoing, undergoing a new assignment process for 14,000 active duty officers. If we had waited, we would have had to wait a complete year before we gathered all this information and did this. And we just sort of said we will take a little bit of a suboptimal execution this time in order to learn all the lessons we need in order to do this better the next time. But we're not going to wait to, to get the perfect solution because it doesn't exist. I think that's, that's about it in terms of... Uh, in terms of, of how we, uh, you know, how we're approaching change and the experiences that I have had uh, had so far, but just like a loop back, I do think it makes a tremendous amount of difference when you've got your senior leaders. You were talking about night court when senior leaders actually embrace the change and are pushing that, and I think uh, you're, you know we're starting to see this as we're as we're moving forward. And I look forward to all your questions. Thanks, General McGee. Well, both our panelists gave us plenty to think about, uh, leading change at the strategic level. Uh, we'd now like to open it up to questions from the audience. Sir, uh, Colonel Mike Johnston, this is for uh, General McGee. Uh, sir, uh, you mentioned the assessment that was done this past summer. Could you um, expand upon some of the results on that? I, I sure can. Um, and I will, I will tell you, I, I was sort of talking about strategic messaging. We have not done a very good job of strategic messaging in this. We'll fix this uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, so, sent out a note to 26 alternates on the infantry and, 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 and armor list saying, we want you to uh, go through this process that might reestablish the OML for, uh, for, inf for infantry and armor battalion command. So we already had a control group, one to 26 of how these people rank. First thing we noticed is five, three people came back and said, I don't want to be a battalion commander, so I'm out. So 23 showed up. The re first results were so interesting after running them through the first iteration in June, we then invited four high primaries off the list to come in and just do it in a non-binding way to see how they would, uh, would do it. So at the end of the whole uh, assessment process of the 23, five outright failed for a combination of height, weight, and you know, overweight failures for PT and for toxicity and for generally not having the cognitive capability in order to, uh, to command. Um, of the scoring and the way we scored this is going to be different for the next one. It was a combination of APFT, writing assessment, and, uh, and a cognitive and non-cognitive assessment is how we established the OML. We saw a 30% change on the OML. We saw one go from number 23 to number one, but an average shift of eight. And overall, the 23 alternate candidates, 11 went up, 11 went down, one stayed the same. Of the four primaries that we invited to go into this process, they all passed, thank God. Um, <laughs> But they didn't take one, two, three, and four. They took two, three, seven, and 13. So the number 13 guy out of 26 alternates in that sort of, uh, 27 alternates in that comp combined population, middle of the road, had been in the, very, in the top 5% of the primary list in terms of, uh, of, of how that went. So, so fairly compelling, uh, compelling results. I can go on if you want me to. But, uh, but from that, we said we're going we're gonna to now scale this to the, uh, to the rest of the Army. 
we will look at five different things that we're going to assess. We're going to so you're and we're not going to tell the exact combination of what the percentages look like, but you're going to pull your rank and position off the OML forward. So that's going to be a part of your uh, of your score. This is assuming you pass everything. Uh, you're going to get communication skills in terms of writing, the communication skills in terms of verbal. There's going to be a cognitive, non-cognitive assessment that's given to you, and then there's going to be a P an APFT. All of those are going to combine to reestablish the OML, and from that, we'll establish the primary and alternate list. Sir, this is uh, Kiran Yabwile, uh, Seminar 6. Uh, my question is, is reference to, uh, with this new system coming on, uh, and I'm talking specifically with uh, infantry, armor, and special forces officers, and specifically in commands of BCT, special forces groups, divisions, and corps. Uh, historically, uh, there has been a, uh, a lack of presence for minority officers commanding BCTs, divisions, and corps. Um, and you go back 30 years uh, throughout the War College, every year uh, you're coming up with the same assessment that we are not seeing uh, minority officers in those particular commands. Congressional uh, research uh, studies, our senior leaders uh, address this. How is the new system factoring in uh, a change and to where we could see a difference um, for minority officers to command these specific types of organizations. Uh, and how long will that take? I understand what you have stated as far as we're trying to get a, a difference now, not waiting 10 or 15 years. And I only ask that because based upon the way things have gone historically, at this pace, another generation from now, there'll be another War College uh, individual asking the same questions about the why is there such a gap in minority officers commanding specifically those types of organizations? Thank you. I'll let you, I mean, you may have some insight. I mean, the, at the core of the issue really becomes, I mean, it really starts from, t if you really want to walk this all the way back, it stems from who we commission and into what branches they commission into. So it really is a acquisition issue from the very, very you know beginning. Because you probably couldn't take a you know a signal officer at the rank of colonel and make him a BCT commander. At least we're not proposing something like that. You've got enough reps in that in that field. And so what we are trying to do in terms we're trying to reestablish or re, or change out the way that we bring in West Point and ROTC officers so there's a consistent system. It's actually going to take that's going to take a little bit of time, and I'm and I'm okay with taking time on that one because one we've got to figure out how to do it equitably. That's harder than you think, um, and two we're also have made some promises to those cadets, so we want to ease those promises in over time. But I think there's also been a concerted look at trying to shape that beginning part of it and then the mentorship throughout. But I don't think there's any easy easy answer that doesn't start at the at the commissioning source and start working them through. It is something that I think we've got better ways to look at in terms of maybe how we could start ass assessing those earlier on who would be good fits to go into the into the combat arms and encourage them that way. But there is there is no easy fix for this, and I think it is going to take some time for us to get that uh, to get that correct. I wish I had an easier answer for you, or a simpler one, but it is as a that is a tricky uh, that is a tricky issue. I have a question for Major General well, Ferrari. Can you, can you let can you let uh, General Ferrari's been around this issue for a while? Anything? No, I have nothing. Okay, yeah. go ahead in the back. I thought I thought I saw your head say no. <laughs> so. Um, I'm Tanya Willis. I'm in the Comptroller Arena, and I've had the pleasure of working the night courts, and they have been brutal. I mean, <laughs> honestly brutal for uh, Army Material Command. And it's a big change for us in how we do business. Um, my questions for you would be, how did you wrangle everyone, all of the commands, to come together and really decide on those pots of how we're going to do business? Two, how are we going to handle the vestitures in the future? Um, because we, you know, we we're talking about bringing in new systems, but yet the Army has a hard time letting go of systems, and that is money that is being wasted on the sustainment side. So first off, uh, I want to commend AMC and you and everybody, because everybody did step up. Uh, and so part of it is I cheat, right? So <laughs> I have spent a third of my career of my 32 years, a little less than a third, in Army PA and E, in a single organization. I was there as a major, and when we were still downsizing the Army at the end of the Cold War, and when the bit plane hit the building, and we started building it back up. When General O brought me back in 2012-ish, uh, 
right? I took apart the army, sequestration hit, and then we had the Trump election and we wound up putting the army back together again, right? So I understood how the ship ran, right? And I had been in AMC. I had been in ATEC, right? I had been in all these different commands, right? Because I was a beneficiary of the last talent management task force, General Oles, right? So I didn't have to go through a structured path. I wandered through the institution of the Army. And so I had a perspective of having been in the commands of what it was about. And in the end, we boiled it down to, right, because I could have said, well, that's not our process, right? You have data and you have senior leaders who want to make decisions. And everything in between that is fair game for change. So one of the things we did was we empowered the commands. So the process between 2004 and 2011 became staff centric. It became headquarters DA knows best because we're smart and froze the commands out. So as we changed the process, right, and I was willing to open up the entire programming, right, because in the end it was about making decisions, right? Okay, let's, let's let the commands be in charge of this <laughs> since they're the ones executing it, right? All right? So a lot of it was about changing how we thought about the problem. A lot of it was framing it. And then in the end, right, we named it Night Court. I named it Night Court on purpose, right? Uh, for those of you who remember the show, right, I, I was the bailiff, right? Okay, right, cool. so. <laughs> But it was meant to signify this is how this is going to be. You're going to be subpoenaed in, right? It doesn't matter where you are, how much money, how little money, you're coming in. And I'm controlling the docket, and the leadership's going to pass judgment. And so you had no choice, right? And it goes back to I had tried to get that level of change through the normal process, but I, as a two-star general, I had the juice. We got some change. Right, so in fairness, all the commands and staff, we got, right, a third of the night court changes came out of the normal process, which was a phenomenal lift. But that last two thirds was hard, and it was a matter of dragging people in in front of the leadership, one by one, and having the other leaders hear that they really meant it. I don't know, does that answer your question? Okay. But thanks, because uh, AMC is, uh, is hitting home runs right now. Can, can I hop in for one second just for before there's a question? So you were all passed out survey sheets if you're an Army officer. If you could fill those out, please. If you could also put in your DOD ID number, which is a little bit of a pain, it allows us to actually check and see sort of like, oh, have you passed out yet? Do they, do you, I don't think you have them yet. Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Erica Halverson is sitting right here. She will race to the back at the end of this, and every Army student should hit her up for one of these, fill it out, and then turn it into your seminar leaders. Oh, when you okay. Get back to your seminar. Yeah. So when you fill out, though, if you could fill out the DOD ID number, that's key. It allows us to sort of look at sentiment based on rank and what your background is. I promise not to track you down if you say that the system sort of sucks. Okay. <laughs> I say, your, uh, your Facebook Colonel. ads will be targeted by your responses. <laughs> Colonel uh, Chris Warner, Seminar 16. Uh, I think the only other besides Night Court and uh, talent management would be the implementation of the Army Combat Fitness Test that would bring in more visceral reaction from the students here. Um, but I wondered, you know, comparing... Steve the, is willing to talk about that. <laughs> so, uh, comparing the I, I implementation... I sat in a brief in yesterday for about two hours on the topic, so go ahead. <laughs> comparing the, the pace of implementation of the ACFT with the Talent Management Initiative, I wonder if you might give us an idea of, you know, how do you as a strategic leader, I mean, you're taking your guidance from the chief of staff, but how does he decide, you know, hey, we want talent management to go quickly. We need to do this now to, to maintain, you know, pace with societal norms and, and the priorities there versus ACFT, which seems very deliberate. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to send out test beds. We're going we're gonna to get data from the field. We're going to do a very deliberate and cautious implementation I'm not suggesting you're doing a non-cautious implementation of talent management, but y your, your pace seems to be going much faster. How do, as a strategic leader, how is, the, how is the chief figuring out which one he wants to move first? How is he prioritizing and emphasizing uh, the pace, or how is he even directing the pace? 
It's interesting because I would have expected your reaction to have been the opposite, that the ACFT is moving much faster than the talent management because at least from my perspective, I read a lot more about the angst in the field on the ACFT than talent management, which is affecting a slice of the officer corps at a time. So it's, uh, uh, mate, you've, you're sitting at the intersection of both. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, so it's a it's an interesting it's an interest it's a good question. So the the pace of ACFT, I think is I think they are not as dissimilar as you would as you would as you would think. So many of the things that have been done within the world of talent management have actually been studied, analyzed, and looked at for 10, 11 years. And there's been a body of data that's been developed and sort of approaches specifically in organizations like the Office of Economic Manpower Analysis, AWIMA, up at uh, West Point. Um, and, and, you know, there have been previous incarnations of the Army's Talent Management Task Force as well. So I think what you're seeing is a rapid execution for work that has actually long been studied and long been developed, but just needed to get some impetus to actually operationalize this and make it happen. My guidance has been from the beginning to operationalize talent management across the, uh, across the Army. So you may think we're going fast. I don't think we're going fast enough. Okay, um, and here's the reason why is you know you've got to hit these changes and they've got to start building. You've got to start developing momentum. We've got to be comfortable with a suboptimal execution, you know, mildly suboptimal. I want to talk about poor execution, but not a perfect execution of a better concept than the near perfect execution of an inadequate concept for the future. I think that's where where we start to start looking at. But if you look at the opportunity for change and how long that lasts. I mean, I would argue we are one significant crisis away from the Army having to focus on something else completely. And we don't control that. Uh, you've got, a, I think, a very strong alignment of leadership right now who are very interested in driving these changes across the Army, from the sector of the Army to the Chief Staff of the Army to the Vice to the, uh, to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs who's worked at OEMA before and done a lot of the thinking of this. I mean, I really think we've got a unique, not too long opportunity to, to drive this change and hopefully it will continue to stay open, but you can't approach this like we're gonna have this luxury forever, and so I think we're trying to maximize the opportunity. So uh, you may think it's coming fast. I don't think it's going fast enough, and I think one of the things we are at least considering is how, when we roll out these initiatives, what populations of officers are we hitting, right? So so the uh, the ATAP, this, re this assignment process, is, is effectively hitting captains to colonels. The BCAP is going to hit uh, senior majors and lieutenant colonels. Eventually, we're going to develop a colonel's commander's assessment program, but that's down the, down the road. I think our next set of initiatives and pilots that we're taking a look at are going to be developed more at junior officers, like at the lieutenant and cap at junior captain level, as we're starting to unfold these. So there is some consideration of that, but I don't ever feel like we're moving too fast, just so you know. I'm going to ask a follow-up to both of you on that. So when you're... Uh executing change, how cognizant are you of the Chief of Staff of the Army's tenure and length and personality in terms of setting up milestones, or is that just one of many uh, time constraints that you look at? Personality is huge, right? I mean, you know, the boss is the boss, and uh, depending upon what his or in the future her priorities will be as the chief, right, those become the priorities of the institution, so they become your priorities, right? So, so I think that that is important. And there is a natural life cycle of a chief, right? It takes a year to figure out what they want to do and how they're going to get it done, two years to implement, and then a year to kind of, you know, make sure that it's got the irreversible momentum. Uh, General, it's been a while since we, the United States Army, have had a chief that came in not needing to get up the learning curve. Right, uh, you got to go all the way back to General Shinseki, really before that happened. Right, uh, General Schoomaker came out of retirement. General Casey came out of uh, came out of Iraq. General Dempsey was prepared, but then went became the chairman, and General Odierno came in. Right, and then General Milley came from Force Comp. Right, so we have a chief now who doesn't whose life cycle of his chiefdom is very different, uh, and so you adapt. You do absolutely 100%. It affects everything you do in the Army's priorities. So I would just say that uh, there are two pieces. So the, the personality definitely affects the priorities. I think the times obviously impact the, uh, the, the priorities as well. General Milley's focus on readiness, for example, was timely. Um, 
I, I do think there's a structural piece to this, and I think that's what I was trying to get after in terms of who's in charge of overseeing long-term uh, long change. I will, I will use the example of a commandant at West Point. So the joke up at West Point from people I've talked to, I've never been assigned up there, is that every new commandant shows up, every commandant knows that they, uh, they only have one year in that assignment, so they try to figure out what they can change up at West Point. What they figure they can change is they can re-scramble the cadets. And so every cadet shows up, re-scrambles companies uh, across the, the core cadets and then leaves, and that's the one thing that they could execute within the tenure of their one year assignment up there. I, I think the similar approach we have right now is, and I think we've got to get better at this, is we've got to have some structural continuity from chief to chief so we don't have these sort of issues because otherwise a chief's only got four years to make a change and there's changes that need to be driven in the management of the officer corps that certainly are going to outlast and span over multiple chiefs of staff of the Army. And I think because of that, that's one of the things we're trying to look at in terms of this structural sort of piece. But I think it's one of many reasons why the things that we've grown up with as an officer is we've seen chiefs say this is critically important and then it has never actually come to fruition after their departure or even during their tenure sometimes. So let me give you some examples. We said that MITs, SPITs, PITs, and all, anything, all those things were gonna be the equivalent of the Tactical Battalion Command. That never came to fruition and no promotion board ever actually reflected that. We said the training battalions were gonna be equal to Tactical Train, uh, Battalion Commands. That, that never happened. We said the AFPAC hands were gonna be a high priority for the Army and that didn't happen with any of those officers. We are now saying that SFABs are gonna be treated special and unique and are gonna get special consideration. We'll see how that transitions over multiple chiefs to see whether that's true or not. But I do think it comes back to that point. We have such a disaggregation of the authority for the management of the officer corps and our people generally that it is subject to, to sort of variations institutionally as, as new personalities come in because no one really has oversight of this. Thanks. Next question. You're back. In, uh, go ahead, right up here first and go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. My name is James Daly from Seminar 22, and I'm a civilian with NGA. Uh, my question is, are, in driving for 10X talent management change, are you considering philosophies, the philosophy of, and principles of mission command, which is critically important for competent leadership and in, in working in a joint environment and building teams and creating a, a, a team of trust? If at all. So, so specifically, what do you, I mean, I can take that a couple of different ways. Are, is there something like in particular, like are we trying to find people who exercise mission command? Are we trying to employ mission command as a philosophy for how we manage people? Or you want me to have both? The first one, sir. Are, yeah. are, you looking at, are you looking at an officer corps that can execute on mission command? Yeah, so we're trying to. So one of the things that I, that I actually didn't mention when I talked about, like, so for example, the data that we're bringing in now for battalion commanders that we're select, gonna select in January. So on Friday, so we, we, we launched and experimented with this tool in June and July, this thing called the Army Commander's Evaluation Tool. Okay, it's like a 360 assessment from peers and subordinates, but there's a big difference. One, we pick your peers and subordinates. We as an Army pick your peers and subordinates. And two, it doesn't take you three days to fill the damn thing out. You're supposed to be able to open it up and fill it out in less than 15 minutes. And it really has been slimmed down just to give you the information that a, a panel would need to know about whether peers and subordinates think this is the right officer to be put in a position of high responsibility. Okay, it is the, and so on Friday, we sent out, uh, so again, 816 candidates. We sent out 26,000 emails for people, to, with a link for people to go fill those out. As just a quick data, a piece of data in terms of how responsive that was, within 10 hours, 5,000 had been filled out and sent back in. Um, so it is the largest, is the largest attempt by the Army to gather in peer and subordinate feedback in order to drive these critical decisions we've ever done within our history. And I think that starts talking about peers and subordinates who actually really have a probably pretty good view about whether you exercise mission command or not, or you're a micromanager, start having that ability to, to provide some feedback in. I, I would also argue on a separate way when we're talking about the hiring authorities being devolved down to a brigade commander who has to be able to do that. I think that's a form of mission command. It's not this sort of Stalinistic central control system where you know, in the summer on the 15th of June, 40 new officers show up at your brigade and you really had very little oversight. You've now got to own the process. You've got to manage that process and you've got to be responsible for building your team. So I think that's built around the concepts of mission command as well. Thank you, sir. Woman in the behind, back. Senate Colonel Michelle Vergara, Seminar 25, softball champs. <laughs> That's a talent. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a skill. 
<laughs> Put it on the back side of your ORB. <laughs> There um, is the reserve component, National Guard, uh, included in this implementation plan. Was there any research done with those components? Okay, so I can say this because I've said this both to the chief of the Army Guard and the chief of the Army Reserve. Uh, so right now, our team from July of 2018 to now has scaled from 10 active duty to 80 active duty to get ahead of this load and start driving these. We have one National Guard officer, we have two reserve officers. And so we are asking for additional people to come in and participate in this. I would say, you know, with that level of investment, they're getting a great return on their investment because we're looking at a lot of Guard and Reserve stuff, but we don't have people dedicated against it and we're waiting for those people to show up from the Guard and Reserve. And I've had this conversation with both of them and I think they know this and I think they're working to get people. So yes, we're working some of the issues. The NDA authorities are specifically geared at least in a couple to help out the, uh, the Guard and Reserve. Uh, the changes for the 2019 NDAA, but I think we've got some uh, we've got some room to grow and, and work with uh, with the Guard and Reserve. Please. Good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Les Martin from Seminar 23. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, the um, so my my question for the talent management discussion um, with recruiting and with a ever ever uh, increasing. Uh, emphasis on on polling data. Is the Army at large looking at why people are exiting the military, either early or on time, or a perceived on time with retirements? And in terms of uh, for the the whole 360 look, if you will, to the Army, um, with regards to making sure that the the right talent is being maintained. Um, and, and is, is not going into either the airlines industry or is just leaving on bad terms. Thank you. So, so sort of two questions embedded in that, and I'll try to hit them you know, separately. So the first question is, is uh, you could ask a different way, is the Army doing a good job of collecting exit survey data from the, the soldiers who leave? The answer is no. Okay, so right now the exit survey that is supposed to be mandated for people leaving the Army is filled out at a 6% rate. We were trying to revamp this process, get something going like in January, February that uh, we're calling the Army Career Engagement Survey that starts gathering this information. We're working it, and we want to be able to start bringing that, uh, that, that information in. To your point, uh, your, your second point, which is about the retention of, uh, of the, let's just talk the officer corps because that's what we're focusing on. Uh, a couple data points and some things that, that, that I think are relevant. So you guys have probably seen, if you're interested in this field, a, a book written by a gentleman named Tim Kane. His name of his book is Bleeding Talent. He's an re, Air Force officer who, who got out and decided to write a book about how poorly the Army does in managing its officer talent. I appreciate the Air Force telling us this. No, actually, Tim Kane's a friend of mine. <laughs> Tim Keynes, he actually graduated from the Air Force Academy the same year I graduated from West Point. We've become friends, and he's actually sort of an adjunct member of our team, so we bring him in as an advisor for a lot of, uh, a lot of this stuff. Um, but the premise of his book was that the Army was losing its best and its brightest, and we were bleeding, we were bleeding talent. Um, I would contend that, uh, that, that that's actually probably not a fair articulation of the issue. The, the fair articulation of the issue is we have no idea. Um, we have no idea. <laughs> what talents are we want to keep. We have no idea of how we track those, and we don't have any metrics that would say those who are most talented for the skills that we're calling war-winning talents in the future are actually retained or not retained within our Army. It's what it means when you have a data-poor environment. It's what it means when you know success and readiness is all based on quantities as opposed to qualities. And it's one of the things we're trying to, uh, to move forward and define a whole lot more, uh, more robustly and with a whole lot more information. But when I talk about having granular levels of knowledge, that's where we can say, hey, the officers who are the highest of these sort of categories are the ones who are leaving at the highest rates. Otherwise, what you see is we're forced to just measure these things using proxies as, 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 a, as a replacement for data that we should have. So, so you know, what are a couple of proxies? So if you go to HRC and they will say we are we are actually retaining our most quality and uh, and and we, we you know we do that based on the manner of performance based on the OERs of the people who leave, I say okay that's great. Anybody here who is running senior rater profile knows the minute an officer tells you that he or she is going to get out of the army, you'd give them one center of mass and if you're smart you get two so you can take care of somebody else. So automatically that deflates their manner of performance. So it's an irrelevant comparison and it's just a completely skewed data in, case, in, uh, in that case. Um, 
And so we just, we don't know these things yet, but that's what we're trying to build is the data structure and the data collection that can actually help us, help us to find this a, a whole lot better. Okay. Please, just go ahead, stand it up, you're fine. Hey, good afternoon, sir. Don Nell in Seminar 2. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Got a lot of support here. Sir, regarding the battalion commander selection process that you mentioned earlier, how are you going to measure the efficacy of this once those individuals go into command to see if the Army is getting a 10% return, a 10 times return, or, or no return at all on, on this innovation? Yeah, I think you got to sort of run with the assumption that adding relevant and, and you know adding relevant information is going you know sort of face value going in. I think you got to run with the assumption that adding relevant information and more uh, you know more angles of assessments and, and insights on people are going to drive you to better decisions. So I think this is a working philosophy. More relevant information drives better decisions. I think the information gathering of this is going to be really interesting because let's just understand what we're going to have. First off, we're going to have how the central selection list would have selected you, 1 to 816. Okay, and then we're going to see how you got reordered under this new process. And then longitudinally, we're going to be able to talk, we're going to be able to measure how you went forward you know, over years and who was a successful battalion commander, who got relief from battalion command, how did you perform, were you top tier, were you selected, I mean, all these different things we're going to be able to say. And then you're going to be able to say, well, look, we took these cognitive, non-cognitive assessments, what are those assessments that are most indicative of the qualities that you actually want to have in a successful brigade commander? So we can start defining by multiple different components what a successful brigade commander looks like. You can then start adding that into your PME to start developing those skill sets within your officer corps. So that's just on the officer side, but let's flip this in a different way, and again, this is where it's just just gets fascinating when you talk about having a data-rich environment, okay? So you're now are gonna have 120 two-star generals, one-star generals, and former brigade commanders who are gonna sit on the board. We are now gonna be able to assess how good those panel members are at assessing and selecting talent for within the Army. So whether they voted favorably or not for people and how they performed. And so over time, you can start saying, hey, McGee, you are a lousy judge of who should be a battalion commander. Like, we're not gonna have you sitting on a panel board anymore or Smith, you know, you're really, really good at this and we're gonna continue to have this because you have demonstrated valid sort of, you know, judgment and really high levels of judgment in your execution of this responsibility. Because like any other skill, there are probably some people who are really, really good at making these calls and some people who are really, really bad within our formations. We're gonna now have a data structure that can tag, can tag those and look at those. And I think that's just, I think that's just like hitting the, the surface of where we can take this as we start moving forward. Hey, sir, uh, Nick Delcor, Seminar 20. Uh, quick question for you with uh, regard, I liked it, kind of everything you said in your presentation here. So how did you come up with that, like your team, all on your own? Did you steal from the other services? Are you sharing with the other services? What's that collegial collaborative environment look like? And then, uh, you know, it's 21st century and looking at space comm, possible turn to the Space Force seems like a large DOD issue collectively. Yeah, so I would say in the first year of this, we spent uh, a lot of time just figuring stuff out. And so, uh, you know, we first had a scalar structure, we had to figure out what we were gonna do. And so we did not as much outreach as we would have liked. I think now in the second year, we're doing a whole lot more, okay? And so we have really expanded our engagements with industry. So the idea of actually being able to track how a panel member votes is exactly what Google does. Like you're on a hiring panel in Google, the, uh, the people who voted yes or no on employees, those employees are, t are tacked to those panel members and over time they get invited or not invited. So, so we've had those sort of engagements. Just after the end of AUSA, we did a, uh, a forum for international armies on talent management. So six different armies came together and looking at these. Uh, the German, uh, German officer, Axel, uh, who's here at the War College, participating in that. You know, really, really sort of interesting. And I think what you find is whether you're talking about industry or you're talking about the other services or you're talking about foreign armies, we all really have the same core problems that, uh, that we're trying to deal with. Different structures, sometimes different cultures, but at the core, a lot of the, uh, the similar things. And so there's some great information sharing that's going forward. And, uh, and, and I, think, I think that's in this second year of this, I think we're getting much better at that. Um, that was the first part of your question. What was the second part? Uh, Space Force? Yes, sir, it just seemed like uh, it was going to be a significant problem as you look to Spacecom. If it, if it comes to fruition to be a Space Force, that you're going to pull talent and personnel out of all the services and kind of whatever you're using for tools to do this, might whoever's got the best practice across the DOD. Yeah, I, it could be. We have, not, we have not talked with those guys yet, but we'd certainly be willing to. 
please. Yes, good afternoon, generals. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vianessa Vargas. I have a question about leading change. Um, I know that um, in the military we cite examples across industry, commercial industry, as how to lead an organization towards change. But I think one of the biggest factors that we have to overcome in being a military institution is we don't seem to set up our leaders to manage change. For instance, we're PCSing our leaders at 12, 18, 24 months. These other organizations out in the commercial sector, they're leading their organizations for years, and so they have skin in the game to ensure that whatever that they put in place is gonna be something that they can see through. So is our services, are our services going to get to the point where we can actually say, you know what, we're gonna leave you in this position four to five years, and I don't know how everybody else feels about that, but you know, if we're gonna really say we're serious about change, I don't think that we can say that honestly, and then you're moving around so often. Yeah, so it, it goes back to, uh, do you understand the institution that you're leading? Uh, I would say that in the Tione Army, that the pattern of Battalion XO, Battalion S3, Battalion Command, Brigade Command provides that level of expertise. So even though they're only there for two or three years, right, they're building it out in the same line of business, just different parts of the business unit. The challenge comes on the institutional and the business side and the policy side because there aren't a lot. We've, we've gotten rid of most of the officers who work those, right? Those billets are gone, right? And, and it's a bad thing. People say, right, so I always ask, right, how many people were mentored? What you really need to do when you come out of being a battalion S3 is go to the Pentagon. How many people volunteer and say, hey, you know, I want to go work in Army Material Command, right? I mean, or Army Test and Evaluation Command, right? So we don't have that expertise, and then we, we cycle people through those jobs way too fast. Uh, and so sometimes a problem isn't a problem, it just is. And so you can complain about the hill being too high to hike over and that it's raining and it's at night, but it ain't gonna get you over there, you just gotta go hike it, right? So in the T.O.N.E. Army, the NCOs are the backbone of that part of the force. In the institutional army, it's the civilians who are the backbone of the institution of the army. And so we've got to figure out, right, some of these changes, right, the civilian part of the workforce is going to have to drive them through and own them and be able to influence them, which opens up a whole other area of exploration is, well, are we developing our civilians right to do that, right? Are they getting the breadth and depth that they need to do that or just the depth? And that's a topic for a whole different conversation, but, uh, you know, I think the functional areas, right, so as a 49 officer, and I managed the 49s, I would leave them in place three, four years, I'd move them after, right, dependent upon the situation, and in my personal case, right, I spent seven straight years in virtually the same job at the end of my career, so, uh, so it happens, but it doesn't happen often enough. So I'll just give you, I'll give you a couple, uh, couple thoughts. I mean, so first off, not every officer, not every position need, you know, not everyone needs to be a change agent, right? Like some do, some don't. I mean, I argue if like you try to rotate battalion commanders so they could constantly be change agents, that would be tremendously disruptive, but some do. I think it's always instructive to take a look at, if you think about the last 20 years or so, who are the leaders of organizations that really adapted to the changing environment after 9-11 to really make those organizations excel? I would argue at least two of them were General McChrystal at JSOC and General Alexander at the NSA, and both of them had 10 years of at least five years to do that. I was at JSOC with General McChrystal, and of course, it was an interesting sort of change to watch for a number of years, because it started out with everyone's like, hey, look, this guy's gonna be gone in two years, we're just gonna wait this stuff out. By about three or three, they're like, oh my God, we're actually serious about it. And then by years four and five, everyone's like, I was always in on these changes, this is the best <laughs> thing ever. That's exactly, that is no joke, that is exactly the way it, uh, it went. I mean, people you know, changed. Um, 
this idea of strategic tenure is, is what's discussed about what, the, what sort of those positions need to, need to have those. But the other piece we're trying to address, and it's harder than you think, and actually Lou Yangard is helping us with this, is this idea is how do we get our Army past this idea of replacement planning to succession planning? So how do we go deeper into the officer corps? How do we find them at the major and lieutenant colonel level and start at least giving them some broadening so over time we can have a cadre a sort of a cohort of people who have been managed to be able to do things like be in charge of recruiting command, be in charge of cadet command. I will only stick with my two-star peers, but there's something within our system right now that sort of has got to be looked at. If the head of recruiting command and the head of cadet command, the first time they're in that command is as the commander, and that doesn't just happen at the two-star level. And so I think that talks about us moving from the replacement planning mindset we have to some true succession planning that I think we're trying to flesh out. Harder than it looks, but I think possible. Well, it's been a very enlightening afternoon. I'd like to thank both our panelists for offering their thoughts and insights. Right now, students will return to their seminar.